This is Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. Talk about not receiving one's own message. This is Wretched Radio. I hold in my never-before-nicotine-stained fingers an article that, quite honestly, I don't know that I will be able to get through with you without... Crying. And yet, before the microphone was turned on, I was thinking about saying, um, hey, uh, the allergies in the South are really bad. Why? So that if I get a little sniffly while reading this to you, I, 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 I don't have to expose myself as maybe having, I don't know, an emotion <laughs> or caring or perhaps imagining something like this happening to one of my children and not being absolutely slaughtered. Isn't it hard for us to be transparent? If you recall, I was just talking about that for 11 minutes. Hey, we need to be more transparent. And yet, as soon as I'm afforded the opportunity to maybe be transparent, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want you to think that maybe I'm an, I can ever have an emotion. Uh, I would never want to shed a tear around my spouse, especially watching that Hallmark movie. Okay, that was a ridiculous example. That never happens. Nobody ever sheds a tear because, let's be honest, they're Hallmark movies. But why? Why can't we do that? Why can't we ever have emotions around one another? Maybe sometimes it's good to do that because our emotions need correcting. Maybe sometimes we can have emotions in front of others so that I don't know they could join with me, that they could join in my rejoicing or my weeping or my crying or my sorrow or my frustration or my difficulties. No, I'm not talking about becoming just a great big dump center. Hey, so how horrible was your week? Rotten, let me tell you everything. And all the kids... Not talking about that. Just wondering why it is that we struggle so mightily to be transparent. Tim Challies lost his son. The Lord decided he wanted him in his presence more. And so, as he had predetermined before eternity began, the Lord took the life of Tim Challies' son, I believe he was 20 years old, going to study to be a pastor. Boyce College. How'd you like to get that phone call? And then there's this phone call. And Tim Challies, who has been appropriately transparent through the death of his son, wrote this article. Mr. Challies, we want you to know that we've received Nick into our care. Rest assured, he's in the very best hands. He gets the phone call from the mortuary because his son had finally been transported and allowed into Canada. Have you chosen the clothes you'd like him to wear? The question seems equal parts significant and ridiculous. How could it possibly matter what he wears in his casket? But on the other hand, how could we not clothe him in something smart, something dignified, something befitting his humanity? So we chose a handsome gray sweater, well-worn jeans, casual shoes. We fold each piece of clothing carefully, a neat pile, one item upon another. The man on the phone said, once we have prepared him, would you like to see him? We haven't seen him in three months, not since the start of the semester. Should we see our son one last time? We ponder the idea for a few moments and decide, no, we don't want to see him there. We don't want to see him like that. Not as our final memory. We have better memories, happier ones. We even have photos of him in that very outfit. And in those photos, his eyes are open, his cheeks are bright, his fiance is on his arm, and he is joyful, satisfied, content. If all we have are memories, we prefer to hold on to that one. The clothes sit by the door for a day or two, waiting for someone to pick them up. And now at last, the driver is on his way. Still, I can't shake the feeling that something is missing, that I've left something undone. It's incomplete. So I go to my office and open the cupboard where I keep my writing paper. I began writing Nick 
letters the very first day of his freshman year. Bits of advice, assurances of love, words of encouragement. I wanted to be sure he never had reason to doubt my joy, my pride, my affection. He kept each one. Hmm. I found them stored in a little pouch in his dorm room desk. Perhaps then it would be fitting to write one more. In the back of the cupboard, I find a note card embossed with my name, fitting. I pause for a moment to consider, is there any good reason to write a letter that no one will ever read? Am I writing for him or for me? Does it really matter? I think back to the words I had written him a year prior. Words of a father reassuring his son, rejoicing in his son. Now I write to him a second time, quote, I love you as much as any father can love a son. I am as proud of you as any father can be proud of a son. I miss you as much as any father can miss a son. Something is still missing. But what? Words come to my mind, lyrics from an old hymn. Forgotten to most, but precious to me. It's a hymn written from the perspective of a Christian who is spanning the briefest of moments between life and death. I sing it quietly to myself. I don't know the the melody, so I'll read it to you. I journey forth rejoicing from this dark veil of tears to heavenly joy and freedom from earthly bonds and fears where Christ our Lord shall gather all his redeemed again, his kingdom to inherit. Good night till then. The hymn continues with a second stanza. As this beloved saint draws his final breath, he offers tender assurances to his loved ones. Quote, Why thus so sadly weeping? Beloved ones of my heart, the Lord is good and gracious, though now he bids us part. Then come the words that suit both the one departing and the one remaining. They are just right, perfect. I take up my pen and write words I imagine he is saying to me, even as I say them to Nick. Oft have we met in gladness, and we shall meet again. All sorrows left behind us. Good night. Good night till then. Love forever. Dad. Then I fold the paper and place it tenderly in his pocket. I gently run my hand over the sweater, feeling it one last time. The closest I can come to feeling him one last time. Good night, my boy, I whisper. Good night. Till then. That's transparent, isn't it? That's a willingness to share a grieving heart. There's a willingness to lay oneself open so that others, perhaps, might be helped and healed. Are we missing it, dear church? I don't think it's our culture. I don't think it's our age. I don't think it's the times. I think it's our fallenness. I think it's our pride. I can't show emotion, affection. I can't show hurt. I can't show grief. I, 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 I can't let people know I ache. I can't let people know what my relationship is like with my spouse or my kids. Oh, if people knew my relationship with my kids, what would they think? And you certainly struggle to let people know how you're doing in your relationship with your Lord. Maybe, just maybe, it's time for us to obey our Lord 
and that the local church, your fellowship of believers, becomes a place where sins can be confessed, shared, struggles can be admitted, so that all of the glorious fruit can come from it, so that we can be helped, so that we can help others, pray for one another, put an arm around one another, love one another, and most of all, most of all, that you and I will be encouraged as we see the Lord working active in other people's lives. But the only way that we can see that glorious work on display is if we're willing to be transparent and say, hey, guess what I was going through? And wow, how the Lord showed up for me. So it may be time for us just to be a little bit more transparent for the sake of his glory. This is Wretched Radio.